give a short scripture lesson this morning from the book of Colossians. Um, and I think the name of that is, is Colossae, the, the name of the town. But we'll just say it's the letter to the Colossians because I'm not sure how to say the rest. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one, one another with all wisdom through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, thanks be, be to God. God. I wonder if you have one of those lists. Now, I'm not talking about a bucket list of things that you need to do before you run out of time. I have no desire to go skydiving. I mean, a list of questions that you want to ask God when you get to heaven. Questions like, why did you make mosquitoes? Why do bad things happen? Why do things that taste so good why are they so bad for you? Now, there was a time that I had quite a lengthy list of why questions for God. But I came to realize that all of these things that I question in life now, and that I ever thought about asking God, it's not going to matter when we all get to heaven. They were all questions that had to do with something that was unpleasant to me. So, setting aside what's going to matter now versus what's going to matter in heaven, eh, it doesn't matter. Well, when we think this way, we come to think this way when we cultivate a spirit of gratitude. And for the next few weeks, we're going to explore some of the many ways that the human spirit is inspired in our way of Christian lives. The way we live and how values in our life unfold. And we're starting with gratitude. It's a theme that we find throughout the whole Bible. There's a lot in the Psalms, and especially in the writings of Paul, like we heard today. His writings equate gratitude with thankfulness. And yes, thankfulness is our response to gratitude, but, but I want us to understand the differences too. Now today's message comes with instructions. You've got a blank piece of paper from your bulletin, right? Everybody's got one, right? blank piece of paper. Get that out. And you had a crayon or pencil that you chose to write with. You guys didn't get one, did you? John, yes, thank you. Somebody's going to take care of that. Okay. So keep that handy. I know that during our sermons, our minds wander, right? You're not going to confess that, are you? Okay. I know that our minds wander. My mind wanders when I'm, I'm listening to a sermon, and occasionally when I'm delivering a sermon, my mind will wander. But I want you to keep that handy, and we're going to be writing down things on this piece of paper that give us a spirit of gratitude. So I want you to think about that. Now, here's, a, here's some ideas of things that might actually trigger you to write something down. Maybe it's a person, it's a family member, it's a co-worker, a teacher, someone in this church. Maybe it's an experience or a time that you were suffering and God came to comfort you. Maybe it's an interaction you had with someone. Maybe it's a good night's sleep. Maybe it's a spirit of gratitude that comes from a life-changing gift, like the gift of faith. Or understanding something in the Bible, the death of Jesus on the cross, the forgiveness of your sins, the Holy Spirit as a guide, your spiritual gifts, your church community, all of those things are possibilities, but, but your list is going to be unique. Allow God to nudge you through these words and write a thought about something you're grateful for. And when that happens, just take that crayon out and write it down. And by the end of this message, you're going to have a wonderful list. Maybe it's on both sides. 
a wonderful list of words to talk to God about, okay? Now, some definitions about this theme of gratitude. First of all, more gratitude does not come from more acquisitions. More gratitude comes from more awareness of God's presence and God's goodness. Today we're not looking at the therapeutic and psychological benefits of gratitude, but there are a lot of those, and they're very important. Today we're focusing on Christian gratitude. Jesus shaped gratitude. It's a byproduct of the way we see things. So gratitude involves a benefit. Now hear this one. This was this. In order for me to have gratitude, I have to have received a gift. There's just layers of message in, in that sentence. To know gratitude, I have to have received a gift. I have to perceive something about what I have received. It needs to be something that was, not necessarily, but it's, it is something that good that I, it's good that I have received this. The Bible has a lot to say about this too. Psalm 103 says, Praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives your sins and heals your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who desires, satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We should all be writing stuff down right now because God does all this. God forgives our sins. God heals us, redeems us, loves us, and our lives are filled with benefits from God. <coughs> We're blind to them most of the time. Gratitude requires that we recognize them and know that they're good. So first we have a benefit. And then we have a benefactor, someone who does the good. To be grateful, we must believe that benefits are coming our way and that they are coming without any randomness or by accident. Benefits come from a benefactor with good intentions toward us. And our benefactor is, of course, God. So in cultivating the spirit of Christian gratitude, we believe God provides every good and perfect gift. And the third element contributing to gratitude is the beneficiary, the one who receives the good, and that's us. We are the beneficiaries of the benefits of God who has your best interests at heart. The beneficiary has a crucial facet. For there to be gratitude, beneficiaries must believe they are receiving something they did not earn, that they do not merit, or they did not deserve. So the first big idea here. Gratitude flows out of God's presence. I want to be sure we're completely understanding of this one. God, gratitude flows from God's presence. I'm thankful for the rain. Or I can be thankful that it's dry. But my gratitude doesn't depend on the rain or the sun. Gratitude comes from God's presence. I'm in a spirit of gratitude because God brings the rain and God brings the sun. And God gives me reasons and ability to be productive and useful in both times. So next, gratitude provides a posture of humility. If I believe I am owed something, I'm not going to be so thankful for it because I think I'm entitled to it. If you give me a car for no reason, I should be overwhelmed with gratitude. I'll say, thank, thank you, I can't believe how, how good you are to me. But if I pay the fair market value for that car, when you give me the keys, I will say, that's fine, okay. But I won't say thank you for this incredible gift, I'm so overwhelmed, because I bought it, I paid for it, I'm owed it. So the sinful nature of humanity comes into play here. We're, it's like we're naturally entitled. We believe that the gifts we are given are rightfully belonging to us. And the more that we think that we're entitled, the less grateful we become. I often wonder why do people who 
keep getting more and more, show less and less gratitude. All right, maybe I'll put that one on my list for God. The bigger our sense of entitlement, the smaller our sense of gratitude. You know, this isn't a new idea. The Pharisees thought they deserved more because they were in, uh, the keepers of the law, the interpreters of the law. But you know, our sinful minds can convince us that we're entitled to anything. And if we don't get something, other people must be messing up. They owe me and they ought to pay me. I'm going to sue them. In our Christian framework, the lack of gratitude is not just a psychological problem, it's an emotional experience. The lack of gratitude is a sin. Paul says it's a hallmark of a life opposed to God. The Bible's word for ingratitude is grumbling. Paul says grumbling is the quintessential mindset of a life without God. Have you ever heard of a church person who grumbles? you have. <laughs> Ingratitude and grumbling lures us away from God quicker than almost anything else. Would you agree with that? The most challenging part of this whole spirit of gratitude, at least for me, is that gratitude is in hard times is really hard for people. But you know that the Christian life involves people. We hopefully thank God for people we get along with easily. And, and you know what's coming. We need to also be thankful to God for the people we don't get along with, who are hard to get along with. Now last week at Faith Church, a prayer request was made for people's general attitude of short-temperedness, especially in places of business. That People were grumbling and angry about changes that had taken place in some of our businesses in the area. We have a member there who works at Walmart, and if you've been to Walmart recently, you notice they've taken out a lot of their cashiering and their self-checking at more places. And there are a lot of customers who are really angry about that and voice their anger at the employees. Our Christian response of gratitude says, even in these times of distress or change, we need to have a sense of peace and oneness with God. Be filled with gratitude to God for placing a grumpy person in our path. How about that? Because it gives us the opportunity to demonstrate God's posture of humility. Be thankful for the grumpy people in our lives so we can teach them something about Christ's love. That's a big one. It's tough. Gratitude grows in humility. Gratitude thrives in response to imperfection. Life with God helps us learn to be grateful for imperfect people in imperfect circumstances. Our job is not to put on rose-colored glasses and always see things as wonderful. Because we know, especially from this week and from yesterday's events, things are not always wonderful. We're going to see times of great happiness that we saw last evening and times of great sadness that the people in Pittsburgh felt. But that has nothing to do with our spirit of gratitude. Gratitude is the byproduct of our spiritual reality. It's not a condition that we can turn on and off like a light switch. It's woven into the fiber of our being. Training ourselves to place ourselves in the mindset of the presence of God and to surrender our will to God. And then we remember and we pray, God, you're right here and we don't need to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. God, we get to be alive in this beautiful creation. God, we are loved by Jesus. I don't like going through difficult times. Nobody does, really. I didn't like the pain that came when my marriage ended. I didn't like it when the man I loved died. I didn't want to go through that pain. I wandered and stumbled looking for purpose, but, but now I examine each of the turns of the last 10 years, and even though life had been has been difficult, 
You know, if it hadn't been difficult, I wouldn't be here now being able to share with you, learn from you, and serve God in this way. I had to go through the darkness, and this is the key. Surrender my pain to God in gratitude to find the light. But the spirit of gratitude God gives us is the best opportunity ever offered to the human race. God asks us, how much will this man and this woman allow me to carry them in an hour of suffering? Now, if we don't ask, answer that question well, we kind of miss the reason for living. We owe our ultimate gratitude for God's ultimate gift, Christ, who carries our burdens. Grateful for our friends, for our house, for our cars, for our money, for our success when it comes our way. For our jobs, if we have them, but the absence of this or of any of this, or even all of this, it doesn't prevent us from gratitude for God's greatest gift. So above all, followers of Jesus, in plenty and in need, in palaces and in prisons, let our benediction be gratitude to God for Jesus' matchless life, his unrivaled teachings, his sacrificial death, his triumphant resurrection. So this sheet of paper, can you, can you hold it up? I didn't see a lot of people writing. Did you, did you, did you write some stuff on there? Oh, look at Oh, my God, yeah, graceful. Went to town, yeah, he wrote a little essay there, huh? <laughs> Keep that piece of paper with you. Keep that piece of paper with that prayer list. These words are your benefit from the great God who loves you. And you don't need to share that with anybody except God. Your heart might be full and singing. It, it, it might not. It doesn't matter. This is our moment to say, blessed are you, O Lord. Let me live with the spirit of gratitude. Always. Always. Amen. Mm -hmm. Invite our ushers to receive our gifts, cards, and offerings.